Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee Arantes. I'm a junior at Woods Cross High School and I'm on the SheTech student board. I'm so excited to be talking with Captain Kristen Bale Wolf today. When they asked me to do the interview, I quickly started watching and reading everything I could to find out more about her. She's amazing and I'm so excited for all of you to meet her. Captain Wolf is the first Air Force female F-35 demonstration team pilot and commander of the team. Hi, Captain Wolf. I'm so excited to be here with you. Are you ready to jump in? <laughs> So help us get to know you a bit more. Can you tell us about your call sign, Bayo, and how you earned it? Sure. Um, it's typically every fighter pilot is going to have a call sign um, that they get from their first combat unit that they are assigned with. So um, I first flew the F-22 Raptor from uh, basically 2014 to 2017. So that was the combat squadron that gave me my call sign. Um, it can come from a variety of different reasons. Um, of why you get what call sign you do. Mine happens to be based off of my last name, Wolf. So Beowulf is kind of what we consider a natural call sign. Um, but they try to tag along, you know, funny stories, either flying related or non-flying related to your call sign. Um, just to try to make a good story out of it, and get you, a, get you a good fighter pilot name, so. That's awesome. What is it like to break the sound barrier? And how does the soup help protect your body? Yeah. Uh, so honestly, breaking the sound barrier, I thought would be a lot more monumental in the jet, but you can't really feel it uh, too much other than when you get into what we call the transonic region. So about 0.95 to 1.05, uh, right around before and post supersonic, uh, you might feel a little rumble on the jet. Um, but honestly, you don't hear anything in regards to, uh, you know, the shot cone or the, the boom that everybody talks about. You don't see anything on the airplane, um, at least, you know, breaking 1.0 Mach. Um, so pretty uneventful and a little bit more boring than people would expect. Uh, but it is pretty cool to say, say you've done that. Um, we do wear a variety of uh, different gear to help us protect us uh, for different things in the aircraft. Um, one of those that you're talking about is the, the lower half. Uh, we wear what's called a G-suit. Um, so that's basically, you know, pants that zip onto our legs uh, filled with air bladders, and those will squeeze the blood um, from our legs up into our head because as we're pulling Gs, um, we can be pulling up to nine times the force of gravity. Um, so that blood also weighs nine times the force of gravity and starts to, you know, drain from your head and your heart, which is pretty dangerous. So um, that helps us while we're pulling Gs. Um, but normally when we're super you know, breaking the sound barrier going supersonic, we're straight and level and not really pulling G's. Um, so two kind of different regimes of flight there. That's awesome. We've seen fighter planes in TV shows and movies. What's it really like to fly one? And is what we've seen realistic? Uh, I'd say Top Gun's probably the most realistic thing you're going to find, although that's Navy and uh, we're the Air Force um, side of things. But as far as the dogfighting and maneuvering and radio calls and stuff, um, and the footage that they are able to get, specifically in Top Gun 2, uh, that's very realistic to what we're going to go do when we go train um, either in close in, kind of like hand-to-hand -hand combat or dog fighting. Um, that's pretty realistic. And then we do a variety of other different missions that we can't really show. And it's, it's hard to show on movies. But um, some more of the sci-fi stuff, like shooting lasers and, and doing that stuff, is a little bit more non-realistic. And we're not quite there yet. What exactly does dog fighting mean? Um, dog fighting is... Uh, when you get into a close within visual range um, kind of arena with a, an adversary aircraft or a bad guy. Um, so you start maneuvering your airplane to basically kill them as soon as you can and not get killed yourself. Um, so you're, you know, doing defensive maneuvers um, to stay out of their weapons range. You're doing offensive maneuvers to try to get weapons off of your jet and hopefully, you know, either shoot a missile or gun the other person. Um, and it really is almost like a fight to the death. So you're trying to, to to kill the other guy before you get killed. Uh, so we practice that in training and obviously we're doing a lot of simulated weapons. We don't shoot anything real at each other, um, but it's it's all leading up to if we were to get into that uh, dog fighting arena with uh, a bad guy down range, then we're ready to go. That sounds really intense. Thank you for explaining that to us. Mm -hmm. I read an article about you that said you flew through a Star Wars Canyon. Can you describe that and tell us about some of the other amazing experiences you've had? Yeah, uh, that's kind of one of the ones that sticks out in my mind as far as um, just the most beautiful, gorgeous view uh, that I've had uh, flying. So probably one of the top five. Um, it's not the Star Wars Canyon down here in the 48 lower states. There's one uh, that people refer to as Star Wars Canyon up in Alaska. Um, so it's just outside of uh, Elmador Air Force Base, right up near Anchorage, Alaska. Um, so we get to do what we call low level flying. So we get to fly down all the way down to 500 feet above the ground level. 
Um, there's some really, really cool mountains that are you know, definitely higher than 500 feet. So you're flying through the canyon, um, you know, 400, 500 miles an hour, looking left and right, and you're seeing, you know, glaciers coming down the side of the mountain, um, beautiful trees, the frozen over river, just really, really beautiful area up in Alaska. That sounds so amazing. Um, I saw that you had your helmet with you. Could you tell us about your helmet? I heard that you can see through your own body to earth below. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, this one up here. Cool. So uh, this is the helmet that uh, I wear when I fly. So um, it's specific to the F-35. So every pilot has their own helmet. Um, it's custom fit to them, um, which is pretty cool. Makes it pretty expensive combined with all the technology that you're going to see up top. Um, I have a different version of the helmet called the Gen 3 Light. Um, so the light version only has one visor, has a couple of other changes just to make it a little bit lighter um, weight wise on your head. So when you're pulling those G's that you're not having as much strain on your neck, uh, which I do a lot during the demo and during those aerobatics. So it's uh, pretty cool for me to have the lightweight one. Um, but bottom line, uh, we don't have, if you're familiar with a HUD or heads up display, like you might also see in some of those fighter movies or Top Gun, we don't have that in the airplane on the dash. Um, all of that symbology is displayed onto our visor. Um, and it's done via basically these two projectors up here, uh, up top are what's going to project all of that information onto the visor. Um, so we see, you know, all of our airspeed, altitude, pitch angle, bank angle, but all the targeting data that we need to, uh, to go ahead and employ those weapons. It's all right in front of our face. So, um, pretty awesome. And then as you look around the cockpit, then you're still seeing all that imagery uh, right in front of your face. Um, additionally, we've got a night vision camera kind of embedded into the top of this helmet, um, which is really neat because uh, legacy airplanes are going to have to wear night vision goggles strapped to the top of the helmet, um, whereas we don't have to do that in the F-35. We've already had that night vision camera up here, and it portrays that night vision video onto our visor. Um, so that's pretty neat. Uh, everything else is pretty much just a carbon fiber uh, external and internal. Internally, like I said, it's molded to fit your head. So it's again, a custom helmet um, to make it as comfortable and lightweight as possible. That is amazing technology. It's really incredible. How did you decide that this was the career that you wanted to pursue? Um, so I uh, started off in high school. I was always interested in math and science and that was kind of what I did well in. Um, and I enjoyed the most. So uh, my dad steered me towards engineering uh, kind of as a goal because I didn't know what my, I wanted my final career to be. I uh, just knew that I was, you know, good at math and science. So um, I started doing chemical engineering in college and uh, finished up that degree at Alabama and then decided that, you know, I didn't want to pursue the full-time engineering as, uh, you know, utilize that degree per se. Uh, but I was very familiar with the military life, being a military brat myself growing up. Um, so I decided that I want to take that into the military and um, just try to do uh, some other career in aviation kind of seemed like the most exciting to me um, and what the Air Force is most focused on. So um, still have the degree, degree in chemical engineering, but I, you know, kind of veered right off path uh, to apply to be a pilot. And then uh, all throughout just kind of had choices, you know, here and there of, you know, what kind of airplane I wanted to fly, what kind of community I wanted to be a part of. Um, and that kind of led me to flying the F-22 and then now the F-35. About your chemical degree, about your degree in chemical engineering, uh, what what did you like about getting it, and how has it helped you become where you become a fighter pilot like you are right now? Yeah, um, I'll say I don't use any chemical engineering being a fighter pilot right now, um, but I think uh, having a degree in engineering is extremely valuable just because it's a process of thinking. It's a you know it's a way that they make you think about uh, solving different problems um, that is extremely valuable no matter what you're actually doing later on in your career. Um, I loved it because it was, you know, some higher level math and higher level science, like organic chemistry and, you know, calculus two, calculus three that I hadn't been exposed to before. Um, so I'd like kind of delving into those uh, deeper math and science classes. What is the most challenging part of your, your job or the most challenging thing you've had to do? Um, the most challenging part, uh, oftentimes just making uh, big career decisions like swapping aircraft or deciding which aircraft to choose, because that determines a lot about us, particularly in the military, you know, where you're going to live, what kind of community you're going to be involved in, um, you know, where you're going to travel, et cetera, and what your everyday job is going to be like. So those are kind of the decisions that stress me out uh, every so often. Um, but day to day, the most challenging part about my job is 
Um, one, trying to get to interact with people in this COVID environment. We're doing a lot of, you know, virtual stuff versus getting to go out in the community and interact with local people, high schools, et cetera. Uh, so that's been a challenge um, and something we're getting used to this year. Um, but honestly, uh, the other most challenging part is just making the demo and all the aerobatics um, look awesome for the crowd that's down there. Because um, there's a lot that goes into it, whether it's on the maintenance side, the public affairs side, actually flying the airplane. Um, and we spent a lot of time briefing and debriefing uh, the perfect way to, to, you know, demonstrate an air show to people. How much practice goes into creating an air show? Um, air shows take years to plan in general. Um, and as far as the demo pilots, um, I mean, I started in late 2019, uh, starting to learn from the last demo pilot. Um, our syllabus is typically about 20 rides in the airplane um, where you're being mentored by the previous demo pilot. Um, and you're constantly, you know, start off, you start off at a pretty high altitude and you constantly get lower and closer and closer to the ground as you get safer and more proficient with the maneuvers. Um, we learn a lot in the simulator first, uh, just to make sure you're safe to fly those um, aerobatics in the actual airplane. Um, but other than that, um, right now in the off season, we practice once a week just to keep our currency up at Hill Air Force Base. Um, and then we're going to hit the road next week and start our actual off station practices uh, to get ready for that air show season. So uh, it gets pretty busy in the summer time frame. That's so exciting. Captain Wolf, thank you so much for talking to me today. I've learned so much. I have one last question. What advice would you give to girls who are considering pursuing a career in STEM? Sure. Um, I would say, you know, pick which avenue you feel the most drawn to, what, what you're going to do well in and what interests you the most. You know, mine was math, particularly with a little bit of science. Um, and so, like I said, when I left high school, I had zero clue what I wanted to do. Um, zero clue that I'd ever end up in the military, but I just kind of followed my passions and try to do well in whatever I was doing. Um, and it kept those doors open um, all throughout, you know, even my career is doing well at whatever uh, interests you and whatever you're currently doing is going to open those doors and allow you to step through a door that you never even knew may open, uh, like being the demo pilot. That's amazing advice. Thank you, Captain Kristen Wolf. Absolutely.